Hey guys, um, so here's another video for the complex course to help with um, practice questions over these really complex topics like shock. Um, so hopefully this will help give you a better idea of some possibilities for types of questions that you might see on your exam um, and also help with some of the content and mix up kind of getting some of those test taking strategies and always my disclosure is, is that I am not a professor in this course. These are questions that I wrote, um, but I cannot guarantee that these are the exact type of questions you have on the exam and your professor's word is gospel, so you always have to go by what they say because they are the content experts. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. So let's dig in. Great topic. So shock, scary topic, um, shocking topic. Um, and so there is three types of shock you're going to need to know, cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, and septic shock for this section. You learn about neurogenic shock excuse me, later. Um, and so you definitely want to um, recognize there's a variety of ways that questions can be asked. Let's start with this first question. It says the nurse is caring for a client who had a recent myocardial infarction who was in cardiogenic shock. What goal is most appropriate for this client? So this is expecting you to figure out, like they're already telling you what kind of shock they're in. They're saying, hey, they had an MI, um, which is very commonly related because remember cardiogenic shock, that's a pump problem where they're not pumping out blood well. Um, so it's saying, hey, for a patient with cardiogenic shock, what's most appropriate? So um, this is a type of shock where I want their heart to be pumping out blood better. I want better cardiac output. Um, so let's see what we can do um, for this patient. So answer choice A. Client will maintain white blood cell count less than 10,000. Hmm. Well, it's not an infection problem. And even if they kept a white blood cell count down, I don't think that's showing that their cardiogenic shock is improving. Because that's what this question's asking. Which of these is going to show there's an improvement in their cardiogenic shock? All right. Client will maintain heart rate greater than 60 for duration of, of shift. Well, their heart rate's probably already gonna be that if it's cardiogenic shock, because they're gonna have an increased heart rate because of that overload of their heart. So I don't think that's a good goal because I don't like, they're not having a bradycardic issue. This would maybe be a good goal for a patient that had neurogenic shock, which you'll learn about later. Um, but um, this is for this patient, they're already gonna have that heart rate goal met, but it doesn't show that they're getting better. <laughs> so yeah. All right, so client will maintain urine output of at least 40 mils per hour this shift. Well, that's pretty good. I know you're going to say, well, what does that have to do with the heart? Well, if the heart's pumping better than my kidneys, who are super selfish and want all the pressure in the world, if they're getting good perfusion, if they're getting good flow, um, then you know that would uh, that would be a good sign that there's better cardiac output. So I do like that one the best so far. Then how about client will maintain systolic blood pressure less than 140 for duration of shift? So. But this one, it's kind of like B, um, you know, their blood pressure is going to be low um, in, in shock. Um, and so I don't want their blood, my goal is not for it to be lower. I don't want it to be crazy high either, but this is making the assumption that they're um, in shock, that their blood pressure is going to be high and that I want it to be lower. But in cardiogenic shock, even though there's a ton of fluid um, and the blood vessels are super constricted, um, the blood pressure is low because that's like one of the, the things about shock is your blood pressure is super low. So I don't like this either. So the only real answer that applies here is going to be C, which is that I want to maintain good urine output, which is a good sign that I am improving because my cardiac output is increasing. Mm -hmm. All right. So a client is admitted to the hospital after MVC or motor vehicle collision, suspect of having hypovolemic shock. Um, based on the data below, which intervention should the nurse complete first? So hypovolemic, uh, hypovolemic shock, um, motor vehicle collision, and there's, uh, they have a hemoglobin of 6.5. So this is telling me some, they're, they're bleeding, they're hypovolemic shock. Um, what's going to be, what am I going to do first? So this is giving me a question where there could be more than one right answer, but which one do I need to do first or what's going to be most helpful, most direct or best to help? So administer an NS 1000 milliliter bolus. Well, they definitely need some fluid. They're in hypovolemic shock, but I have to think about what's going to be most direct. What did they lose? They lost fluid, but what did they also lose? They lost blood. And so I can replace all the fluid in the world in a patient, but if they're missing blood, I've got to replace that blood. So my second choice there, eh? mm -hmm. administer two units PRBCs. I like that. That's my top answer right now, but let's keep going. Administer norepinephrine. Hmm. So um, they may need it. They're in hypovolemic shock. Their blood pressure is probably low, but if they don't have any fluid in the tank, there's nothing to squeeze. So I can't give that. And then administer antibiotics. Well, I'm definitely probably going to be worried about some like tetanus or open fractures and other stuff going on, I'm sure. 
Um, I'm not creating a story, I promise. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm sure that they're probably going to need antibiotics at some point. They're going to probably need some surgery, et cetera. But that's not the thing I need to do first. Right now, this patient's bleeding. They're giving me this value in the question. The hemoglobin is low, kind of cueing me like, hey, they're bleeding. Do you see it? So yeah. So what's the best thing to help a patient who's in hypovolemic shock that is bleeding, losing blood, is to replace what they're missing. So B is the best answer here. Now, if they weren't bleeding and if they just had a low blood pressure and let's say that they, um, they're, uh, maybe they had too many diuretics or something like that and they're in hypovolemic shock because of that because they just had too many diuretics. Well, then replacing fluid would be appropriate because that's what they're missing. Um, but for this patient, they are missing blood, so we need to give blood. All right. <clears throat> A nurse is caring for a client with septic shock. Based on their vital signs below, what is the priority action to complete for this client? So similar to the last one, so septic shock, we're gonna look at their vital signs. So their blood pressure is 70 over 50, that is low. Their heart rate is 125, that is high. And again, like I was talking about for the hemodynamics video, I like to put arrows here um, when I can. I know you can't do it for um, your actual test. And their respiratory rate is fast and their temperature is elevated. And it pretty much looks like my answer choices are all saying like, which vital sign am I going to treat first? So it's pretty much saying like, what's my prior reaction? Um, so my first choice is to give acetaminophen 650 milligrams PO. And so like real, real quick as like all the, this question is giving answer choices. I'm probably, I might do all of these things. I might do some of them, not all of them, um, but it's saying, what do I need to do first? Like what's most important for me to complete? So um, do I need to treat their fever first? Well, fever is definitely not fun and it's uncomfortable, but usually fever is not the priority action um, to treat, especially not in a state of shock because that blood pressure is much more shocking than um, that temperature. So they're, they have an infection, something's going on. So they're going to have a temperature. I need to treat it, but not necessarily right now. All right, administer metoprolol, 25 milligrams intravenous push. Well, they do have an elevated heart rate, but they have an elevated heart rate because their blood pressure is so low. So if I give metoprolol, it's going to decrease their heart rate, maybe temporarily, but it's just masking or it's Band-Aid for a different problem that I'm not even fixing. So I don't think that's going to help. Administer norepinephrine continuous infusion. Well, I like that because their blood pressure is super low. So I definitely want to do that. I know that we do pressors um, for septic shock because it's a vasodilation. Um, well, let's look at my last answer. Administer 1000 milliliters normal saline bolus. So this is a good question that's asking, do I do fluids first or do I do pressors first? And like we talked about in the last question, we have to have fluid on board um, before we can give pressors. Now, in a question like this, we could also give you a CVP and kind of throw you off. See if you recognize that if the CVP is normal, they have enough fluid, we just need to give that the pressors. But I did not give that much of a trick in this question. I just wanted you to see if you knew that you do fluids first when it comes to sepsis. Um, what do you call it? So we always have to make sure they're fluid resuscitated. So like, I'm not going to start a patient on pressors until they've received their fluid boluses or until they are fluid resuscitated per their CVP. Um, so that's something to definitely keep an eye on when you're looking at it. Fluids first, in, uh, especially in sepsis, um, until their CVP is normal, and then we can give pressors. Question four, a nurse is caring for a client in septic shock who has a right radial arterial line. Which assessment finding is most concerning for this client? So this is one of those kind of like the um, question I had about PA catheters on hemodynamics that we also need to know how to manage the lines that a patient that might be in shock may have. And so this is an arterial line. So we're saying, what am I going to be concerned about if a patient has an arterial line? An elevated, and they're in, uh, we also have to keep in mind they're in septic shocks. This is also kind of testing, do you know what a patient in septic shock looks like? So they have an elevated heart rate. Hmm, well, a patient in septic shock is going to have an elevated heart rate. So that is expected. Decreased blood pressure. Here we go again. And this is another one of those things that if there's two answers that are both similar enough where they're saying the same thing, they're saying, hey, um, like these are two things that can happen in a shock patient. Um, you know, is one of these the most concerning? Well, they're pretty much equal. Having an elevated heart rate and decreased blood pressure, those are pretty, e excuse me, equal. And so like, if they're both pretty equal, I can't choose one of them because they're both the, like saying the same thing. They're both saying, hey, these happen in septic shock patients. Are these okay? Um, but um, yeah, you'd have to know what a septic shock patient looks like to, to know that. But so A and B are saying pretty much the same thing. So I'm going to kind of cross them out for now. Capillary refill greater than three seconds in my right hand. Well, I don't like that because that radial art line is in that side, but let's keep looking. Um, client is sweating and feels hot. 
well, they have septic shock. They have some sort of infection. They're going to have a fever or something most likely. So that's expected. So then I'm looking at my answers. A, B, and D are all talking about what's normal for sepsis. And then C is talking about something we are going on here with my capillary refill. Usually capillary refill is less than three seconds. Um, but if there's any signs, a patient has an arterial line, which goes in your artery, your radial artery. Um, if there's any signs that uh, <clears throat> they're having decreased perfusion to their hand, it can mean that there's an occlusion or there's something wrong where that um, radial art line is um, occluding their artery. So that's why we do like the Allen's test and stuff like that before we insert those and um, or draw from um, an, ar an, ar an artery, excuse me. Um, and so we always have to check uh, circulation really closely for anyone that has an arterial line. So the most concerning finding is going to be C. The other ones are going to be expected for a client with septic shock. Tricky, tricky, Mrs. Woodruff. All right. Question five. The nurse is caring for a client with the findings below. Which condition has the client most likely developed based on these findings? All right. So they could also give you a question like this where they're going to give you symptoms or things um, related to someone who's in shock or something like that. And you have to figure out what shock are they most at risk for or what condition as a whole are they most at risk for? So we have a patient who has a urine output of 15. So that's showing like their kidneys are not working. They've decreased urine output maybe some dehydration going on. Um, CO2 of 65, that's elevated. So showing something's going on in their respiratory system. They're not exchanging gas the way that they're supposed to. Uh, white blood cell count is 17,000. Looks like they got some sort of infection. Creatinine is three. So it looks like they're in kidney failure. So then it's saying, which of these is it um, is most, uh, what, what condition do they most likely develop? The first choice is cardiogenic shock. Well, I don't see anything to do with the heart here. And so um, even though your urine output might be decreased or your kidneys might be hurting as a result of cardiogenic shock, um, it's not an infectious process. I don't really see anything that's related to cardiac. So I'm sadly going to have to cross that off the list. <clears throat> then there's systemic inflammatory response system. Well, some of this stuff looks like it, like the elevated white blood cell count, but I don't see a lot of those SERS criteria like the elevated heart rate or the elevated or decreased temperature. Like I don't see the other signs of SIRS on this. So I'm going to cross that one out. A urinary tract infection. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on here with the urine output. So there's uh, like low urine output, elevated creatinine, but then it has this other stuff and it has the white blood cell count. But then the CO2, that doesn't really, that's not really consistent with the urinary tract infection. Um, you don't necessarily hold on to more CO2 because of a UTI. So then my last choice is MODS or multi-organ dysfunction system. Hmm. Um, and um, so I think it's supposed to say syndrome, by the way. Um, and so um, at the end of the day, like we have to think about what it says, what they most likely developed. Most likely the patient's showing signs of kidney problems, elevated white blood cell count, <clears throat> and lung problems. They have two or more organs that are in failure. So we are looking at multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. <laughs> so um, the best answer here is going to be D. It's definitely important for you to understand the difference between SIRS, MOD, sepsis, and septic shock. Um, so if you don't know, make some flashcards about those or kind of write out how those are different from one another and what signs and symptoms that you're going to see that are going to differentiate those. So a client is in cardiogenic shock and they're on a milrinone drip. Hmm. What is the primary expected effect I think that's the wrong effect, effect, mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to spend all day analyzing my lack of knowledge over the basic English language, but don't judge me. Just love me for who I am of this medication for this client. So, um, they like, what do you call it? So first I'm going back here. They're in cardiogenic shock. So at the, let's say I did not know what this drug is. Let's say that you're on a test question and you're like, oh my God, I don't know this drug. And you're freaking out. Keep in mind, sometimes you don't have to know the drug. You can look at the condition. So what am I hoping to do for cardiogenic shock? And so I remember that's that heart pumping issue. And so I'm going to be on a lot of meds. that are going to help my heart to pump better. So sometimes that alone can help me to solve this question. Let's say I didn't know, but if I did know milrinone is a positive inotrope, so it's going to do what I think it's going to do, which is help increase um, my ability for my heart to pump and move blood forward. So what is the primary expected effect of this medication? Um, am I expecting it to decrease blood pressure? No, I don't want less blood pressure because I'm already having a problem uh, with that, with shock. 
So I do not want decreased blood pressure. Decreased blood volume. Well, I definitely want that for cardiogenic shock because they are fluid overloaded, but I don't think the milrinone is going to help with that. Um, uh, it's not a diuretic. Increased heart rate. Again, it's like A. It's like kind of that same thing I told you about before when you have two answers that are effectively both going in the wrong direction or both doing the wrong thing or doing the same thing. I don't want an increased heart rate in cardiogenic shock. My heart rate's already elevated. So my last choice is increased cardiac output. Now, this is the only answer choice that is good and that is correct, of course. <laughs> and so, um, but um, it is also the, um, what do you call it? Um, it goes back to what we said before is even like, let's say that you didn't know what known was. You go back and you look at, okay, what is my goal or what am I trying to achieve for cardiogenic shock? You could get this one correct. So the correct answer there is is D. Last but not least, a, a nurse is assessing a client with septic shock. The client has an elevated heart rate. Oh, let's see, they're writing everything out. Tricky, tricky. Um, low blood pressure. Okay. Increased respirations. All right. On auscultation, the client's breath sounds are coarse and the client reports having difficulty breathing. The client is in science tachycardia with frequent premature ventricular contractions. What stage of shock is the client most likely experiencing? So this is another part of shock that you need to know is the different stages. So there's the initial stage, the compensatory stage, progressive stage, then refractory stage, kind of showing you from start to finish. Um, so I need to see where this patient's at. So in the initial stage, there's not any signs and symptoms. So I can kind of cross out initial, like they're like, okay, it can't be that. Um, compensatory stage is where the, you know, the body tries to compensate and it's trying to do stuff to help and it's working. Um, so I would say that, you know, that like there's, there's patients starting to show some signs of actual like organ failure. So I would say that um, uh, it's not in the compensatory stage, like the, because like compensatory stage is kind of like that point in the semester where you guys are like, I can do this. I'm going to survive before, you know, you have crushing defeat. I'm not saying you guys don't survive, but you know, like there's that point, like right before the exam where you're like, I've studied hard. I know I've got this. And you get to the exam and you're like, I'm dying inside. So like kind of that's the compensatory stage where you like build yourself up. You're like, I've got this. And then the progressive stage is when you um, <laughs> admit that it's going to be harder than what you meant. You're going to pass though. I'm not saying you're not going to pass. I'll take it that way. What I meant more is just that, you know, kind of like that, like that uphill that you're like, you build yourself up and the progressive just starts breaking you down. So that's why I like to think of. So progressive stage is, and this, trust me, if you sit there and think I'm making fun of you, I am not. I was a nursing student not that long ago. And also I have crushing defeat all the time. Uh, what do you call it? Because I am still learning and I am all new at this. So trust me, I go through these stages myself. So there's no judgment here. But anyway, so progressive stage is where stuff starts to break down, organs starting to fail, um, you know, and your things are starting to not work well. And then the refractory stage is where like things are not working well at all. Multiple organs are failing. Um, there's really no chance of return. So um, the best answer for this one is going to be that they're in the progressive stage. If you did not know, because this is where they start to, um, what do you call them, have the, um, like they're filling up with fluid and they start to have worsening problems breathing. And then they start to have signs of their organs not working, like getting dysrhythmias. Dysrhythmias are super common in that progressive stage. So based on the information given, um, the best, um, the best, way of uh, like figuring out which one this one, uh, the best answer for this question based on the information given is gonna be progressive because we're not compensating anymore. There are some organs actually failing, but we're not yet at that point where everything's complete crap and there's no chance of survival. So right in that middle happy stage. So little by little. And anyway, hopefully I didn't want to end this on a sour note. You know, I wanted to end this with lots of hope and letting you know that you can do this. And I know cardiac is hard, but um, just sink into the loveliness of what it is um, and know that um, a lot of you guys are not going to become ICU nurses um, because you don't want to, and that's okay. Um, but, um, you know, you may not have to remember this forever, but if you do love and want to know this, just know it comes with time and lots of experience and lots of situations and scenarios. And you won't always be tested over this information and in such a, <clears throat> in such a way that um, it causes like, you know, crushing internal defeat. So eventually one day you'll be out there taking wonderful care of patients and doing great things and not, um, you know, going through the stages of shock <laughs> in your emotional uh, in your emotional mind. So just know I love you all and I hope you enjoyed these videos over cardiovascular practice questions. I'll see you for the next round.